Hello everybody, thank you very much for joining us this evening. So today we have a session that is part of our Supporting Progression series, which is predominantly for teachers, careers advisors and support staff um, looking to support students to transition into higher education. Today we have Mark Hughes, who is the head of sixth form at Hartlepool Sixth Form College with us. And Mark's going to be looking at the changing nature of leadership in education. And um, we are on Teams Live today, so just give you a little bit of a heads up of how this works. You can hear and see us, hopefully, um, but we can't actually hear or see you. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, you're very welcome to use the Q&A function, which should be in one of the top corners of your device. And that'll give you the option to send over any questions that you may have about Mark's presentation. I have been lucky to see a little bit of a snippet of Mark's presentation uh, yesterday. And so you're in for a treat. It's fantastic. And I will hand over to Mark now. Thank you, Jade. Um, um, bit of a big intro there, uh, a lot to live up to. So um, welcome. My name is Mark Hughes. I'm the head of Hartlepool Sixth Form. And uh, this is the part of the Teesside University Online Support and Progression Series. And my session is predominantly going to be looking at the changing nature of leadership in education. Now, um, as Jane said, we had a quick catch up yesterday and based on the attendees for this uh, presentation, I know most people are from a post 16 background. So what I've done um, last night is I made sure that the, the content and the, the direction was based around um, post 16, which is where most of my career is, is progressed from. So just to give you, I suppose, a bit about my, my, learning, my leadership journey uh, and context around that. Now, so over the past 20 years, I've progressed in various sectors within post-16 education. As you can see, I've experienced different geographical locations, different educational settings and post-16 post sectors. Now, as a result, I've experienced a range of different leadership styles and strategies whilst also having to adapt my abilities throughout my journey based on the uh, environment I'm in. Now, I started off my journey as a teacher of sport and PE and assistant head back in 2000 at Queen Mary's College in Basingstoke, so a sixth form college. I progressed to head of PE at Strode's College in Egham. Then I decided to jump into FE and I'll talk about what happened there and my rationale for that throughout the, the presentation. And I moved to the Greenwich Institute as first of head of school for sport PE and public services. And then I progressed internally to group head of partnerships, which is a business function. So I moved from curriculum to business support. I then moved to the University of Hull as the outreach manager and in charge of the uh, 4.1 million NECOP fund that is available for University of Hull and worked with about 42 different schools, seven FE colleges on widening participation. Then in August 17, so three and a half years ago, I moved to um, Hartlepool as head of Hartlepool Sixth Form. On, um, I was appointed on at merger with, with Sunderland College. We now form um, with Northumberland College, Education Partnership North East. So a partnership that spans from um, Berwick up on the Scottish borders all the way down to, to Middlesbrough. So as you can see, my, my journey over the last 20 years has been quite varied. I've worked in different um, educational institutions and I've got different experiences from those. And obviously I wanted to share those with you today. So before I explore what skills, values, uh, drivers, future leaders may need, It'd be good to look at the changing nature of leadership over the past 30 years. So what was leadership like historically and what does it feel like to be a leader now? Now, over the past year as a senior leader, I have the experience of how the pandemic has impacted on educational institutions, it's impacted on local communities. And as a result, you now I believe leadership styles and skills are about to adapt too, to be more focused on what is important and with key drivers now based around well-being of student communities and colleagues. So I have a quick look at the historically and what it is like to be a leader now. So what was the educational landscape like and how did it impact on leadership? Now, obviously, I've just told you that my first appointment was in 2000. So um, it was obviously this is now before my time when we're talking about 1993. And obviously, because it was before my time and to get an insight from from what that was like, I had to speak to, to various friends. Now, 1993 in the incorporation of the English further education was an important date as colleges broke away from council control. So principals now had the power to run colleges as they would like. 
As you can imagine, though, this was a steep learning curve for leaders as they adapted to having more freedom in how they run their own college. Now, when I did ask a principal in a very large college, he did fall about laughing when thinking about three year strategic plans. He told me one year is a plan, three years is a dream. So as you can imagine, breaking away from local council control meant that colleges could move quickly to fund resources and make changes. So there was some good things. The same principal also told me over a story in which it took him three months to add a £250 ramp to his estate due to council bureaucracy. So they had a lot more power and a lot more say in how they run their own college. However, leaders have much to learn, skills to develop. They, they needed the freedom to take long term decisions and essentially be able to run the institutions like a business, but they did have a lot to develop. Now, you could say, you know, if we're looking at research, preferred learning styles of ed educational leaders at that time was more activist learning styles. Why? Increased pressures on school leaders to act decisively and quickly, so actions had to be the overall priority. Now, this would lead to a decrease in the perception that analysis and synthesis and planning are relevant and necessary functions in leadership and management. Now, when I joined post-16 education and a teacher and progressed into leadership at the start of the 2000s, there was a clear shift in leaders planning for the future. Now, I can remember going into um, meetings about curriculum for the following year, and it was called curriculum planning. And then over the years, that became business planning and curriculum managers and heads of faculty became more accountable as leadership shifted downscales to focus on that middle leadership tier. As a sport and P lead, my areas always benefit from the new financial wealth as a result of the increase in numbers and income generated per student based on program hours. Now, at Queen Mary's College, I designed and built a 1.2 million sports facility. It included a swimming pool and fitness centre. When I moved to Strode's, I had the opportunity to build a new fitness facility and at Grimsby, a new sports hub with multi-use games area or mugger pitch. Sport was always seen as a positive driver to increase student program hours because you can efficiently do it um, through sports and recreational activities and generally by using sports coaches. So I, I suppose I've always benefited from that change. Now, over the past 20 years in the profession, I've seen a real shift from managing to leading across the sectors that I've worked in. I, like I said at the start, I also feel that the working across both sectors in the time has also helped me to develop as a leader. Six forms probably didn't adapt as quickly as general FEs uh, did in uh, during incorporation and 1993 changes. However, they did lead the way and through setting high expectations, outcomes for students, um, outstanding outcomes through systems and processes supported achievement and progression. Now, when I moved into general FE, those skills really helped me to influence and lead staff in understanding outcomes and improving uh, achievement and value added. Now, value added wasn't necessarily something that was on their radar, but successful completion and achievement was. However, what was evident is my business planning skills was not as developed as my senior head of school colleagues. So I believe that working across both sectors has improved my leadership skill set and future potential, as I had the sense that the landscape was changing and future collaboration between sectors was going to be essential. And I was right. The outcome of post-16 area views in 2015 was the establishment of these new strategic partnerships between post-16 institutions and in some cases also involved secondary schools and universities. So you needed a broad knowledge and understanding of what um, was required that spanned across key stage three to key stage five and even beyond. I believe it was my previous experience working in both sixth form and general FE and university sectors that allow me to have the knowledge required to be successful in my application to my current role. Now, as head of a traditional sixth form with a um, general FE partnership, Hartlepool Sixth Form merged with Sunderland College in August 2017, and we're now collectively known as Education Partnership North East, after with the, the merger with Northumberland College more recently. Now, I always say one of my strengths is that I can speak both languages. Since 2017, I've worked hard to establish GFE processes with it whilst maintaining a sixth form ethos. Hartlepool Sixth Form has a proud 
history and maintaining it was essential and it formed part of my be proud staff plan when I joined. Be proud as in be prepared, be resilient, be outstanding, be unique and be developed. In the years before CAGS, extracted overall achievement rates based on retention and path rate, pass rate, Hartlepool Sixth Form would be ranked eighth in the country when compared against other Sixth Form providers. We have had a great journey so far, but there is still much to do. So what's leadership like now? Well, the education climate is very complex and certainly different. Over the last year and now it's unpredictable, it's unclear, it's uncertain. What I sense is that leadership will need to evolve and as a result of the pandemic, economy is going to be tough and leaders will more than ever need to be focused on how best to improve outcomes and support positive progression to destinations. Especially when there's so much going on around us externally, that can distract our focus. People will talk about the beginnings of the fourth industrial revolution with the increase of modern technology and AI, also known as Industry 4.0. Maybe leadership too will have to go through its own revolution, maybe leadership 4.0, I, I don't know, maybe I've just invented my own new phrase. So what do I believe will be the most important skills, drivers and values that future leaders may need? Now, one thing is for sure, with so much going on now in education, leaders will need to focus on important influences. Now, looking at research in his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People in 1989, Stephen Covey's circle of concern and circle of influence distinguishes between proactive people who focus on what they can do and they can influence and reactive people who focus their energy on things beyond their control. We need to focus on all our energy on things that we can influence. This will allow us to make changes as our circle of influence starts to increase. You also find that as your circle of influence starts to increase, others see you as an effective person and this will increase your power. Focus is key to make changes. But why can change be so difficult? Now, I totally believe that change is just not about logic. It's about changing people's hearts and minds. Now, I've talked to you about as a, as a sports coach, you know, I'm also a rugby and football coach. Now, I can formulate data sets. I can prove that a particular set play, attacking formation, corner routine is the best. But without engaging the emotion of players too, I never seem to be able to get buy-in and change their perception. Now, I really can't get away from using a real life example. Now, from a physics standpoint, underhand throws are a better method to shoot because the ball lands softer at the rim and therefore decreases the shooter's margin of error. But even when challenged with this information, the famous basketball player Shaq O'Neal, um, who hasn't, to be honest, got the best free throw line record. In fact, I think he's probably even a top 10 worst performer statistically. He said, I'd rather shoot zero than shoot and hand. That goes probably to say something about sort of basketball players and their and what they feel people think about them. Change is not about logic. It definitely is about changing people's hearts and minds. Now, my CEO always used to talk to me about wicked problems. Uh, and then when we discussed these wicked problems, because I'd always come to her with an issue, I couldn't work out you know, what, what the solution was. And she referred to these as, as wicked problems. Sometimes a problem is so complex, you don't even know where to start. Now, there's normally when you look at uh, research for this, there's probably 10 um, aspects to what a wicked problem is. I've just picked five that I quite like. Number four, every wicked problem is essentially unique. It is. It doesn't have set numbers of potential solutions. There's no way to know whether or not your solution is problem and uh, final, and there's no definitive formula for a wicked problem. Wicked problems are a nightmare, but you can consider tackling them with different theories. So how do you tackle them? Design thinking. Now, if we look at traditional thinking and design thinking, design thinking is all about well-framed questions to start with, exploring many ideas, and you could do this on your own, you could do it as part of a team, um, you could do it even in large groups. I've read research in which I think Google had one of their meetings and two, uh, they had nine and a half thousand employers 
over one and a half um, hour meeting, did some design thinking and explored um, ideas to, to, possible, to, to um, possible solutions based around framed questions. So how can we put this into practice? Now we can use something called rapid prototyping. Now, for those that have experienced a meeting with myself, I'm renowned to jump up and start doodling ideas on my notice board. I've always had a massive notice board, if not two, um, in which during meetings, um, once we're focusing on stuff and we're coming up with ideas and we're, we're bouncing ideas around with each other, it really helps to my management team to focus on gathering notes. Um, I doodle my ideas down and then we formulate solution based on those. I really like this way of working and many of my best strategies and solutions have been a result of rapid pro, um, prototyping. So we mentioned some skills that emerging leaders might need for the future, but what about specific drivers? Now, key drivers are not themselves detailed strategies. Instead, what they are are key decisions leaders have to make when thinking about their organisation and what they must do. Leadership drivers help to understand what is absolutely essential for your organisation or institution to accomplish. Now, a new era is unfolding in which digit, uh, advances in digital technologies are causing us to reevaluate our relationships with one another, with our institutions and with ourselves. Re research is suggesting that there will be five key drivers of change that will impact learning over the next decade and imagine what those drivers of, of change could mean for educational leadership. So the first one is automating choices. Artificial intelligence algorithms automating many aspects of our lives, including potential in teaching, learning and assessment. Now, already organisations such as Century are, are using AI to support feedback and some of it, there's other systems too out there that can do the same regards to, to maths feedback. So what about artificial intelligence and then personalisation of feedback to staff? What about collaboration between schools to share big data and what, what might support improvements and, and in doing so support their local communities? Educators today are in agreement. They need an AI strategy, but many institutions don't know how to implement one or where to even start. Leaders of the future will need to unleash the power of AI for education. Accelerating brains. People have increasingly uh, increasing access to tools and insights are reshaping our brains in intended and unintended ways. We're all about learning and teaching and our brains and how they work impact hugely on that learning. Rapid advances in technology and neuroscience are combining to transform our cognitive abilities in intended and unintended ways. They are shaping how we partner with digital tools, relate with each other and engage in our surroundings. Great leadership's about developing people. Neuroscience, just as important for a CEO head as it is for a teacher in a classroom. It's our jobs as leaders to help ourselves and our staff to be more confident and to do things we do, do not want to do. Now, research um, from Gore in 2013 suggests that change makes uh, everyone think of the F word, which of course is fear. She explains that change makes people fearful. Now she uses the FARC strategy for leaders to combat fear, and that comes with um, focus, attention and awareness, repetition and celebration. If you wanted to find out more, um, you can research Gore's, there's an article on the secret formula for change. Remaking geographies is another key driver. The pandemic is global. If you're not aware of the global situation, then you cannot be an effective leader. Resources and services are supplied globally, so it's important to understand how these might impact on learning. How might education play a leading role in helping cities, towns, rural communities find a new signature identity? How might new ways of creating a, uh, economic value in communities and regions change what is meant to be ready for work? Number four is uh, sustainability roadmaps. Now, this is becoming increasingly more important. And in conversations with students, I can hear them talk about um, the environment and sustainability in conversations. As an institution, though, how can you be more um, scalable and agile whilst delivering high quality? That's something that industries and organisations in post 16 are going to have to consider. How can you sustain communities that uphold responsibilities towards our planet? 
I don't believe the post-16 uh, sector is, is yet in a position where it can fulfil its role in supporting the realisation of the UN Sustainable and Development Goals, nor the post-COVID-19 zero carbon agendas. Leaders of the futures must look to change this. The sector needs to embed sustainability across the formal curriculum, the learning environment, and the encounters learners and staff have. This is sometimes, compet sometimes competualized with a model of the four C's, campus, curriculum, community, and culture. Now, last but not least, probably the most important driver, I believe, is subjective well-being. Now, you can see that on this slide, we've got five factors to subject well-being, health, security, the environment, relationships and purpose. And you'll see alongside that that you've got linked priorities. So for if you took, for example, relationships, you'll see that line manager leads to the importance of communication, support, stretching and enabling growth, atmosphere, fairness, you know, change management, all things that are considered important regarding relationships. If you think about others at work, you know, we've got the support, respect and personal investment. Now, one system that we use within Hartlepool Six Women as part of Education Partnership North East is we utilise a Thrive survey to discuss with um, our staff their thoughts and feelings, and it helps to, to focus on uh, the key priorities regarding staff wellbeing. It's something possibly worth um, investigating if you're interested in subjective wellbeing is, is Thrive survey reports. So, so bringing it around to a conclusion, um, in summary, we've identified some key skills and drivers that leaders, leaders of the future may require in an uncertain world. New enhanced and developed skill sets to include self-belief, resilience, and having focus are gonna be essential. Design thinking and rapid prototyping to help solve wicked problems. Leaders need to be agile and flexible. To put it rather simply, learning agility is knowing what to do when you don't know what to do. It is the ability and willingness to learn from experience and then apply that learning to perform successfully in new situations. Finally, smart mob organising is the ability to create, engage with and nurture purposeful business or social change networks through intelligent use of electronic and other media. Leaders are what they can organise. Can you organise smart mobs using a range of media? It's something to consider for, for, for the future. We've discussed the importance of the five drivers in helping leaders to understand what absolutely is essential for uh, organisations to accomplish. The values is quite interesting. I undertook a quick research into schools and values, uh, college values from around about 20 different random institutions. Now, empowerment, enterprise, collectedness and transformation, uh, those first four are really common groupings and I've, I saw them in about 50% of those that I surveyed. Transparency is an important value to have. However, quiet crap transparency is the ability to be open and authentic about what matters to you, but without advertising yourself. This begins with humility. Leaders who advertise themselves and take credit for their own performance will become targets. There is one skill that's gonna be essential for future growth and that is the ability to collaborate. Which kind of brings us full circle. Now, if you go back to what I said at the start, and since colleges were incorporated in 1993, they have been tasked with, complete, with competing against each other to grow student numbers, to better their neighbour, to increase their income. So little surprise then that working together is often fraught with difficulties and that sharing joint working Learning from each other and mutual support happens less than might be hoped. Turn that picture into one of collaboration and shared destiny for mutual gain is a big task, but the gains would be absolutely enormous in the remaking of communities. Now we know that in the recent College of Future report, it recommends that schools, post-16 providers, higher education training providers and industry work together on supporting communities and closing gaps, uh, skill gaps through developing specialist employer hubs. 
Um, and um, within the last uh, six, seven months, you know, I've been privileged to sit on those committees and discuss the, the college of the future and feed into that report. Through honest and transparent conversations, a systems approach will allow post-16 institutions and higher education providers to play their respective strengths, signpost students to each other and celebrate the success of each other. That way, we could all take a part in helping to create economic value in communities and regions to ensure that we, we really do remake geographies and, and communities. Now, now, will this be possible? Leadership in education has come a long way since incorporation in 1993. Leadership styles and techniques have evolved. Through robust business and curriculum strategies that supported financial resilience that has allowed for investment in post-16 infrastructure, local communities have benefited and grown. However, more than ever after the pandemic, a connected educational system is essential to support the skills agenda and reskilling of communities. Future leaders will have to utilize all their skills, values and drivers to effectively collaborate and make it happen. So that's my end of my presentation. Um, we have obviously sort of half an hour for now for, for Q&A. I've just included on this slide um, my uh, Twitter handle if, if anyone's interested to, to get in contact. I'm more than happy to follow up on on Instagram. Um, you would have to search for me though, Mark Hughes is quite a popular name. So uh, if you search for it, you, you know, you'll be able to, to recognize that my background and they were advertising as, as head of high level uh, sixth form. And I've also included my email address too, because I'm, I'm more than happy to have conversations with um, colleagues um, who want to discuss any aspects of the presentation um, or what the future of, of leadership may look like. So uh, with that, I'm just going to hand back over to Jade. Um, Jade, have we got any questions? Is it okay if I come back into the room as well? Is that okay? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So we've got one question, Matt, just while we uh, wait for any more to come in while we're uh, um, chatting. But the first question, I, I think you maybe summed it up in that last slide, to be honest, but somebody's asked what would be the one key skill you would look for in a staff member that identified they had potential to progress into a leadership role? That's an ace question. Um, really, really good question. Now, I, I sort of did summarise it. Um, the ability to collaborate, I think, more and more is going to be essential moving forward for in, in leadership. Um, like we said, it, since sort of 1993, there's been a real sort of increase in competition, you know, generation uh, generating income and money within um, organisations. And sometimes, therefore, as a result, colleges have worked in silos. They probably kept themselves to themselves. So for me, it's about um, leaders being able to show the ability to, to flex on that, be it their communication skills, their teamworking ability, now how they can develop team, now how they can develop those external um, links. And, you know, obviously use of social media to drive that forward is, is quite a good, um, you know, I find sometimes in conversations on social media, I can generate new ideas with, with how to progress forward. So for me, it would be um, a, regarding collaboration. Great, thank you. Um, and one more has popped through. So somebody's asking what the project or achievement you've been most proud of through your career. Fantastic. That's another great question. Now, for, for me, the, the biggest achievement I had, and this is all really to do with um, my, my move to, to Hartlepool Sixth Form. So, you know, at the point of merger in, in August 2017, um, they obviously merger meant that um, Hartlepool Sixth Form merged with Sunderland. Um, from what I could see uh, at Hartlepool Sixth Form, the, 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 the potential was, it was incredible. It was outstanding. I knew there was um, the ability to be outstanding. And as a result of that, um, I, saw, I, I initiated my Be Proud project. And that project really was making sure that I listened to staff when, when um, looking at the future, looking at um, um, staff wellbeing, because I knew that actually the I had what I needed, I had the tools, I had the staff and colleagues available to really make a difference locally to the community, to improve outcomes, you know, and take us on that journey in which we would be compared with uh, the top 10 uh, sixth form providers within the country if we extracted that data. 
So for me, the biggest project for me would be um, under, undertaking that uh, that project. But the the essential part of that was listening to to to, to my staff, my people. I, I would have never ever been able to do that without doing that and formulate a plan based on what they required. Uh, thank you. Oh, and we've got one bar that's just popped through. Um, what would you say are the biggest challenges for young people that we work with today? Without a doubt, mental health. Um, it's, you know, I, I walk around the, the sixth form um, over the last you know, few weeks and I always thought to, to and my first question is, is it great to be back? And you honestly can see the relief on being back. Um, this has been tough. Within a sixth form, within a post-16 environment, we only have students for two years. For year, our current year 13s, their year 12 was disrupted um, and half a year was spent um, you know, working in isolation from home. We welcomed them back only for one term to send them back away again. You know, we welcomed in our year 12s uh, and obviously they had the same experience in year 11. For me, the biggest, the biggest um, concern and something that we do need to, to target is uh, the mental health and well-being of, of students. It's been an extremely tough time for those guys over the last couple of years. Um, and, and they have come on, on, on one hell of a journey, probably a unique journey. And I would imagine in 20 years time, they would be going for job interviews and people would be talking to them about, oh, oh look, you're great. You know, were they, were they cags and tags? Because again, they'd probably get labeled under that, that brush. But it's, it's been a unique time, but for me, um, for students, that's the, the, the biggest concern. I would also say, bolted onto that, is uh, I suppose that could impact on social mobility. I'm seeing an increase in numbers, either going to university and returning, uh, to, to go to universities that are nearer, or maybe thinking about previously going to, to universities that are distant, but actually now considering staying at home. It really has changed um, their, their mindset about movement. You know, is this going to impact on industry moving forward? You know, and the ability to gain those qualifications and then move into those jobs. You know, or can it actually um, help the local economy? Where you know, in places like Hard Hartlepool, where you know it's possibly renowned for you know what what is known as the brain drain, where students gain you know valuable qualifications with you know amazing institution at post 16. They have fantastic institutions like Teesside University on their doorstep, but then at that point disappear to, to take jobs in London and Manchester and Leeds, you know, in those bigger cities, might actually benefit local economies by people staying there. So it's going to be an interesting next two or three years. Um, but yeah, mental health with with young people and just making sure that they um, they're supported on their return to, to school and making sure that those year 11s moving into year 12s for next year are supported on that transition from schools to sixth form. That's going to be key too. Absolutely. Something I always have said more recently than normal is that that age range, it's such a difficult time in the most normal of circumstances, isn't it? And then to throw out all this uncertainty and still being expected to do internal exams or tests or whatever we're calling them, referring to them from college to college, it's really difficult for them. Um, yeah, I, I absolutely don't envy anybody going through this period of their life. And it's very much thinking about how we, how we can support them very holistically. It's not just uh -huh. about those hardcore academic, getting your grades, making sure you're getting that curriculum. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think within a sixth form content, I suppose, um, what, what comes probably more naturally is that sort of that academic aspect and actually making sure that they're, they're working hard. But I suppose I'm almost flipping this back now. You know, I'm seeing students around college that are, are almost probably working too hard because they're stressing about what the future might hold. Um, you know, teachers are frantically finishing off um, curriculum to make sure that they're supported on those next steps. They don't want them to go to university and not know some concepts or some topics that have not been covered. So I, I suppose so I'm almost trying to make sure that students' well-being, that they're actually not doing too much to make themselves unwell. So it's it's going to be tough. And you know, we do need investment from, and there has been an investment from government, you know, catch-up funds has, has supported those um, extra sessions to make sure that students are prepared for those next steps. Uh, and we need to utilise them as best as we can. 
Absolutely. I think higher education institutions have a responsibility as well during those periods of um, enrolment and clearing and whatever students are going through. They need to um, be as flexible as possible during those key periods as well, I think. And not just being that, but getting that information out to students and applicants that, you know, we understand we've, we've got a really good idea of how difficult it's been and we're not going to, you know, have that sort of black and white line that we potentially may have had previously that we are very much understanding of situations and will work as flexibly as we possibly can within those admissions processes. Absolutely Jade and, and, and looking at obviously transition from year 11 to year 12 mm -hmm. you know one, one aspect I'm, I'm always looking at you know within the context of the, the local community in the region um, you know is that you know that sense of moving up to the next step is always tough um, and the the easier we can build up those relationships, the easier they, they can see who where their next steps are, uh, feel confident in those next uh, steps. So actually that that real it's daunting anyway to, to walk through that door and walk through that gate and walk through those doors into you know a, a big sixth form that actually we support them as best as we can in that transition. And you're right, you know the universities I'm sure are doing all that they can too. Absolutely, thank you. And we haven't had any more questions come through, Max. I'll just do one final shout out. I can see we've still got some attendees here. So if you do have anything else you'd like to ask Mark whilst we are online and live, please do send your messages through. Um, let's just see if we've got anything else. No, it doesn't look um, like we do have anything. Um, else coming through. So I think we'll, we'll just follow up on that. And I know, as you've said, Mark, you are very happy, aren't you? If anybody would like to get in touch with you, follow up on this. Um, we have recorded the session as well, so we can distribute this out to everybody that's attended and booked on. Please feel free to share it far and wide with your colleagues as well. Um, I'll put myself back on camera so you can see who's speaking. Um, yeah, but just wanted to say a really um, big thank you to Mark for that session and thank you for being involved in the Supporting Progression series. We really do appreciate your support in the event. Um, for those of you that have loved the session today and have attended previous sessions, we do still have a week and a half's worth of um, events and workshops running right up until the 30th of April. So if you haven't already, please take a look on our calendar of events, get booked on. We do have Mark's colleague James delivering a session next week um, on engaging and effective learning online. So if you do like the sound of that, please do come along and support James as well. But thank you very much, Mark, for that. And thank you for everybody that's attended. Hope you enjoy it. And we will see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jade. Thanks, bye.